Okay, folks, we're going to go ahead and get started. Yeah, I know, we need a gavel. Everybody can either sit down or if you're going to stand at the back, that's fine, but let's go ahead and um, get everybody settled in. Thanking everybody for coming out tonight and for welcoming you to our um, second Red Drum um, Town Hall. We had our first one Monday night up in Savannah. Um, I'm Carolyn Belcher. I'm the Chief of Marine Fisheries. Um, and I'm here to kind of just introduce you to what our process is going to be tonight. The first thing I want to let you all know, this is not public comment like what you're thinking of in, from years past. We are currently providing you with information about what the status of our red, stump, red drum stock looks like as far as the population itself and to talk to you a little bit about concerns that we're hearing from the fishery. Um, we completed a um, satisfaction survey of anglers. Some of you may have participated in it. It also was sent to the charter captains um, to kind of get an idea for what you all are feeling relative to our regulations. And the, the full survey approached four species but tonight we're just gonna focus on red drum. Um, I'd like to start off by asking you all to make sure that your cell phones are silenced um, so that we don't have um, issues with sound quality because you can tell there's a lot of reverb in the room. We've got folks who are on Zoom, um, so we're, a lot of this just to make sure that we don't have noise issues with across the, the internet and within the room. Um, what we wanna do tonight is present to you, again, our biological findings for this stock and talk to you about proposed actions that we have. There are five of them. Uh, you will get two presentations this evening. Jared Flowers, who's our unit leader for the research and surveys group, will talk about the biology of our stock. And Kathy Knowlton, who will be on Zoom, um, will be talking to you about the results of the satisfaction survey. Between the talks, we'll have a, a question and answer session. We ask right now that you keep those questions specifically to the presentation as it comes through. Um, and we'll do our best to answer any questions that you have. Um, and the main thing is, again, just not getting off track. Uh, Kathy will go through the satisfaction survey for you, which will give you more information. We will provide you a comment sheet at the end, which has the proposed actions um, and some alternatives under that or options that you can comment to us what you think about what we're looking at to propose. Um, and then if you have other specific comments you would like to make, you have that option to write on that as well. So each action has a place and there's an overall comment section for you too. Um, so with that, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and talk to Tyler. I have Tyler talk to y'all first for those of you who are in the virtual world so that you know how the Zoom is going to work. Um, and from there, we'll hand it over to Jared. All right, just for everybody, so we're all on the same page here. Uh, we're doing this via Zoom, so there are people listening on their phones and their computers. Uh, when it comes time for the question and answer session, there'll be some folks with microphones walking around. We, we ask that you speak into those microphones so that everybody at home that couldn't make it tonight can hear your questions and then hear the answers from our, our folks here at DNR. Um, I appreciate it, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jared. All right, can everybody hear me well? So we're gonna have to manually move slides around so it'll be a little bit clunky, but um, Tyler, if you can go ahead and bump up the next two. Yes. So tonight I'm gonna talk about um, status for Red Drum in Georgia, and this is based on data that we have. This is based on information coming from our surveys. Uh, Tyler, next. So within the state, we have different data sources for red drum. Uh, one of them, as you might be familiar with, is MRIP. Uh, this is the Marine Recreational Information Program. This is, a lot of times what you'll see, this, this is related to the creel clerks that'll meet you at the dock and, and ask you questions about your catch. Uh, this is a federal program that we participate in and are cooperators with as a state. We also have six state surveys that focus on or encounter red drum that provide us information 
And I'll kind of go over data from each one of those, but kind of the moral is that um, each one is designed to kind of look at a different aspect of ridge run biology, different life, um, and, and look at a different aspect of um, population levels or fisheries or, or whatnot. So you'll kind of see that as we go through. Thanks. Okay. All right, so the data I'm going to talk about today, it goes through the end of 2021. We're still obviously collecting data now. Um, next. So the first thing I'm going to start out with is talking about MRIP. So as I said, it's the Marine Recreational Information Program. And this is one of our longest time series of data. Uh, for this program, we have data from 1981 to present. And what this chart is, is catch per unit effort and harvest per unit effort of red drum in the state over time. The dark line is, oh. is up. Is that better? Okay. All right. So the dark line is catch per unit effort, where it's the, the gray dash line is harvest per unit effort over time. The vertical bars are each one of our regulation changes that have happened throughout time. So um, initially there weren't any regs in the early 80s and we added things like bag limits, different um, harvest size, like minimum size and slots. Um, one thing to take away from this is over time, there's a lot of variability in the trend. Um, there's not really any clear pattern. It's fairly stable, but there's just a lot of variability in noise, which is fairly typical of a lot of fish populations and what we're seeing. Um, one thing to notice when we have reg changes in the past, there's not necessarily a, um, a noticeable change in catch. I mean, it, it, there can be some over time and there probably is some additive effort over time, but there's not an initial change or reaction um, you know, if we get more constrict, constrained, there isn't necessarily a drop or a rise and catch the next year. Um, so it's just something to keep in mind. Um, harvest is, you know, especially once we've started putting regulations in place, harvest is much lower than catch, which would make sense because we're, you know, folks are catching more fish than they're harvesting. So, I mean, it's a fairly typical pattern, um, but there is just a lot of noise in this, and you'll see this kind of as we go on. So, other information we get from MRIP is harvest length. So this is um, information, the bars are number of fish harvested or proportion of fish harvested in a different length range. So these are one inch length classes. The dotted box is the slot size, or at least under current regs. And this is data from our previous regs, which are, um, the 14 to 27 inches with a five fish bag from 1993 to 2001. And then the gray bars are their current regs, 14 to 23 inches that's been in place since 2002. And a couple of things stand out here. One thing is under both reg patterns, the bulk of the fish are in the lower, the bulk of the fish harvested or in the lower end of the slot. Um, so people are typically catching a larger proportion of smaller fish. Um, also, once the regs went into place, the larger fish above the slot obviously disappeared. So with the um, longer length limit, you see a longer tail as people are catching more older fish. Um, but, you know, as time has passed and our regs change, you know, it's, you know, the tail is, is much shorter. Um, one thing to, to point out too, this is a 30 year time frame, and the pattern hasn't changed in 30 years, which typically could be a good sign that you know, the population might be relatively stable and there hasn't been a big fall off one way or the other for those older fish. They're still there in some capacity, but they're not totally gone. Um, and something to kind of talk about later a little bit. Right, next. So looking regionally, the same data, looking at catch per unit effort and harvest per unit effort, but we split it by the top three, the northern three counties on the coast and the southern three counties on the coast. And what you can see here is there's not really a big difference. Catch per unit effort and harvest per unit effort are fairly similar among both different, to both sections. So even though populations and, um, you know, maybe pressure is different in different areas, overall there's not a huge difference in what we're seeing across, across the coast. So, build this one. So, 
One thing we noticed when we looked at all of our data is there's a lot of agreement in the data. So this is the MRIP catch per unit effort data that I presented before. This is just on a truncated time frame from 2009. So we start adding our different state surveys. So our Gilnet survey, which um, is our primary um, index for young of the year, red drum that are being recruited to the slot. We lay this on top. Our trammel net survey, which samples the same fish just a few months later. Our coastal longline survey, which, sand which samples adult mature fish offshore. And then we have our carcass donations, which is fishery dependent. It's volunteer donations from anglers who are volunteering to donate their carcass at coolers, and we process those. The thing to take away from this is, in all of these surveys, even though they have different sources, they are sampling different aspects of the population, there's largely a very similar trend. The same, you see the same peaks generally, you see the same lows generally. So what it's telling us is that whatever is going on in the population, we're seeing those trends and those, those patterns through all of our surveys, which, you know, means that it's a clear signal and also means that our surveys are all picking up the same thing. So maybe if we, you know, have a down year in a survey, you know, we should see it in the other surveys. Um, and, you know, if we miss a year, like we missed a year along line because we had vessel issues or COVID issues, you know, as long as we have some of the other surveys, they should be able to fill in the gaps. But the key is that we're getting a consistent story across all of our surveys. And that's all of them together. So the other thing to look at um, is the size distribution that we are sampling in our surveys. So once again, this is the slot. And our gillnet survey, as I said, samples young year fish as they're beginning to recruit to the fishery. And basically is borne out by their size. They're all smaller fish for the most part that are just below or just entering the very um, far bottom of the slot. The next we have the trammel net survey. Like I said, it's done a couple of months after the gillnet survey. Um, you're getting the older fish, but you're also getting some, some larger fish, not very many, uh, but some larger fish are the top end of the slot, above the slot. And then our coastal longline survey, which gets those much larger fish that are outside the slot. And these are the ones that are typically going offshore and coming back in the spawn. So between all of our surveys, we have a pretty good coverage of sizes, and it's you know, giving us more information about what's going on. So one thing that we can gather from our carcass information is, are the annual changes in length and age of the fish that are being harvested. So as you can probably imagine, the fish, the average size of the fish and the average age of the fish are being harvested throughout the year are not the same size or not the same age. And typically, um, as those young fish are recruiting into the fishery in fall, which these are months down here, um, around August, September, you're starting to see those, those small fish come in, they're, they're legal, and the bulk of the fishery is catching those. And as the year goes on, um, early parts of the year, they're generally larger, older fish that are coming through. So you know, we can kind of track the cycle of fish as they're coming through during their life cycle. So one of the other newer, well, it's an old survey, but we've, we've basically taught it some new tricks is our cooperative angler tagging survey. And this has been going on since um, 1987. But since 2018, we've added some improvements. We've really tried to um, increase our effort for getting tags out. In this time period, we've gotten 6,000, we're just over 6,000 tags released, and we've had just over 1,000 tags returned to us. Um, of those returns, 95% were within the state, 3% were in Florida, and 1% were in South Carolina. Uh, some of y'all may be aware, um, we have double tags out. The double tags give us an idea of how well the tags are staying in. So when we start to look at model estimates and, and try to do some calculations based on the tags, we know how well those are being retained. Uh, we also have high reward tags, which are the pink tags, which you might have seen signs of or maybe you've caught. Um, these are giving us an idea of how often and, and at what rate the tags are being reported back to us. So once again, that goes into helping us estimate um, things like re well, reporting rate, which helps us estimate things like mortality and movement. Um, and then, you know, it gives us information such as uh, proportion, well, the fate of fish, but like one big thing is that 44% of our return tags 
that are legal or in legal fish are harvested. So um, less than half of the fish that are caught that are legal based on our tagging are actually kept. So, you know, fish are getting returned and um, I have, we have more data kind of looking at as different aspects of this. A lot of this information too, and kind of more in depth, is in uh, the annual reports that are online. I should mention that before, but we do have the annual report or the, the status reports online on, on our website. And I think we have links to that in the talk and, and with some of the information, but they gotta go through more detail here. So one of the things um, that we also, you know, we increased the number of tags, but we also wanted to supplement and kind of fill out the sizes of fish that are being tagged. So, you know, the cooperative angler tagging survey is angler driven. Uh, Donna does a great job of outreach and, and giving people tags and helping, you know, inform people on what to do. And historically, our cooperative anglers, which are the orange bars, have tended to tag larger fish that are in probably the middle of the slot and out, outside of the slot. To help better inform some of our estimates and figure out what's going on, we put more effort as a staff in the tagging. Um, fish in the smaller end of the slot. So between these two efforts, we've been able to cover a better size range of fish. And also, um, we've also been able to cover just about every sound and every little creek and river in the, in, the, in the state, which is good. So we have really good coverage between size and area of our tags. One of the big things we can get from the tagging information among things like uh, growth and, and um, you know, fate, but is really fishing mortality. And that's what is really important for estimates and stock assessments and, and kind of gauging what's going on in the population. Um, these are fishing mortality estimates from 2017 to 2021. Uh, the highest is 0.1. So in relatively speaking, that's pretty low for fisheries populations. I mean, you see um, fishery mortality estimates as high as 0.5 and some that are really heavily exploited. But um, this is pretty low for a number. Um, this is also very similar to numbers that have been found in the regional stock assessments that have, been, that have uh, taken place in 2012 and 2017. So this is in line with things, it's not alarming. And as we go further on, these numbers are actually gonna go down more as we recover more tags, because you know the key is getting those tags back and having more times for those fish to be out there. So as long as there are fish out there swimming with tags, we're getting those returns, these numbers should improve. Another new survey that we have is our escapement project. So this is using acoustic tags where the cooperative angler tagging uses the small plastic dart tags. This project uses um, acoustic tags of a battery and produce um, acoustic sounds that are underwater and they're coded. And we have receivers and arrays and we plant these, the tags in the fish. If they swim by one of these receivers that are underwater, the tag will make the code and the receiver can pick it up. So these things sit out there 24 seven. Um, they are uh, distributed right now. We have two arrays in Wausau Sound and St. Simon Sound. The Wausau Sound is the oldest. So in Wausau Sound, we have 63 red drum tag. Um, they average between about 13 and a half and 30 inches of the fish that have been tagged. Um, so it's a good size range. And so far at the end of 2021, we had 29 fish were detected total of 440,000 times, which, you know, is a lot. Um, 11 were caught by anglers, four of those were harvested, and eight of them, more importantly, were, de were detected outside the study area. The ones that went outside the study area, on average, were about 24 inches, so these are larger, just above slot. Six of them traveled to South Carolina, and two moved south of Georgia, and later moved up to South Carolina. So this map here, Wausau Sound is here in the, in the box. The green dots, if you can see them, are the receivers where those fish were detected. So we have, or have had an array offshore of St. Simon Sound. So that's what was detected here. And then South Carolina has their own receiver array and they can pick up our fish and we can pick up their fish as well. Florida also has an array and other states up around the coast have an array. So as these fish move around, um, it gives us an idea of where they go. Um, we can figure out things like seasonal timing. And, you know, it, you know, it's important because, you know, this is a regional stock. This isn't just a Georgia specific stock. These fish move around. That's why we have regional stock assessments. And it's important to kind of get a handle on where they're going and, and how they're behaving. 
Um, in general, what we've seen so far is not surprising. Smaller fish tend to be more stationary. They tend to stay in the sounds. Larger fish are definitely more mobile and they're the ones more likely to show up offshore. And we're gonna keep tagging. And like I said, we, we expanded to St. Simon's Sound now. And uh, as we go forward, you know, we have about 100 more tags to put out over the next few years. They, the tags have a four to six year lifespan. So, you know, this is a long-term project that will hopefully will pay dividends over time. So for just some kind of discussion and conclusion to wrap stuff up. Um, so our red drum populations are stable over time with a lot of recruitment variability. And this is pretty typical of a lot of long-lived species. You know, the red drum will live to 60 years. They can have bad year classes and still sustain a population. If you have a lot of bad year classes, that's a different story, but, but you do have a lot of regional, uh, sorry, annual variability. Um, what we're seeing here is the same patterns we're seeing in regional stock assessments in other states. Um, as far as our surveys, we are seeing the similar trends in the surveys. As I mentioned, you know, with that chart, you know, we have you know, five or six surveys that have the same pattern, uh, which is good because it kind of tells us you know, there is something going on. We're not getting conflicting information that's really having us scratch our heads. We have a pretty good feel uh, when we think of what's going on. And one interesting thing is that it's debatable if other states are seeing it, but our longline survey, which samples as older mature fish, tends to have the same annual pattern as our surveys that are looking at the smaller juvenile fish. And typically you think a longline survey that's sampling adults would be lagged. So like if you had a high year for adults, the next year would be high for juveniles and, and vice versa because spawners and recruits, but we're not quite seeing that. So it might lend to there's some, something else going on out there. Um, which, you know, I think is part of the issue. Environmental, region, environmental and regional population dynamics have a lot to do with numbers of fish we see. Um, abundance is, does seem to be cyclic. Um, one interesting thing in the past, we had a low year of 2012. It was one of our record low years. Virginia and Delaware had record high years. And so it seemed to indicate that maybe fish might have been, you know, as a, as a population moving up the coast um, and could be lending to some, you know, long-term geologic, geographic shift with, you know, possibly changing water temperatures. The other threats to red drum populations that we know are out there and exist, you know, habitat degradation, and coastal development, you know, increasing populations, that, that's an issue everywhere. Um, increased overall fishing effort, um, that's one thing that you'll see when we get to our next presentation that, you know, there is increased effort and, you know, that's just, you know, an issue. And for us, especially in like South Carolina, it is a regional thing, they're seeing an increased targeting on mature adults. So the bull red fishery is becoming really popular. And even though it's a catch and release fishery, you know, there is release mortality and there are things to worry about there. And that may long-term have a larger effect on the fish population uh, than some of the recruitment issues. So conclusion, just some future activities to be aware of. Um, there have been, we don't do stock assessments of our own in the state, but we do participate in regional stock assessments. And there have been, um, several of these in the past 20 years, and you might hear more about them. Um, the most recent was in 2017. Um, but earlier this year, we've completed a regional simulation assessment, which is identifying the model that's going to be used in the next benchmark stock assessment. And the benchmark stock assessment should be starting maybe later this year, early next year, but should be completed in 2024. And that's a regional stock assessment between Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina and uh, Virginia, Delaware, and maybe the other states that may encounter fish. But um, we've been involved in these assessments. Uh, CRD is, data has been used in all the prior assessments, and you know, we we're part of that process. So, you know, we get a lot of information there, and it definitely you know gives an idea of what's going on in the region. That's not just limited to us. So, some of that connectivity you know really gets explored in these updates. And for now, we're going to continue to gather data through our tagging and escapement programs. As I said, um, we have these long time frames, these four or six year tags, you know, we, we're gonna be continuing out there getting data. And, um, you know, our, our regular surveys or gillnet survey, trammel surveys aren't going anywhere gradually over time, you know, as, as we see a need or as things um, come into play, uh, we'll improve those surveys and continue the tweak. Uh, one thing for gillnet and trammel surveys, we added additional sound system, um, in 2017, 
2018, 19, sorry, 19. Um, so, so now we instead of, we were originally just sampling Wausau and Ultima Tunnel Sound. Now we're also uh, sampling St. Andrew Sound. So it gives us a good uh, distribution across the state, and, and that'll help us see if there are any other regional differences going on. So, with that, um, I'll take questions. I do want to point out if you have uh, additional comments, you know, we'll have the paper to pass around. Um, but we also have the thing set up at the website, the town hall, and I believe that's also where um, this presentation, uh, the status report, and the other, pre other presentation are located. So, thank you. Thank you. So That's a bad spot. So I was at Tuesday's meeting in Savannah and we went through the gill and trammel nets and you're saying that those two methods of sampling, they're a couple of months apart, but those are still focused towards that low or first year class fish. Is that correct? Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, yeah, more or less. The gill net is specifically focused on red drum and that, and that recruiting to the uh, recruiting into the fishery. The trauma net is a bit more. Uh, okay. The trammel is a bit more generalized. So, um, the gill net goes for three months, right? And then the trammel net follows the next three months. So, there's not really a separation. They're just back to back in three months period. Okay. And the long line is focused more on those mature fish, that 27 inches to the what we consider the bull red. Yeah. So, yeah. my question is in Savannah, you said that this fish is complex. It's got a 60 year potential lifespan versus the trout that's, you know, much less. And the statement was that it's supposed to be managed or it should be managed as three separate fisheries, that first year class to up the slot, the slot fish, and then up to the mature fish that are sampled in long lines. So it looks like to me that there's gill and trammel nets that focus on collecting data on that lower size fish. There's long line focused on collecting data on that mature bull size fish. Are there any plans or any methods being explored to look at that mid size fish that I guess what would be the middle age class that y'all say have to be managed? Yeah, um, so it's kind of a two parter as far as traditional netting and the long line. It's sometimes tough to get those fish because they're mobile, they're moving and they're offshore. So that's where the tagging has come in. So, you know, because we're putting these tags in, um, it's getting a different type of data. So we're not getting these index data, but we're, we can, you know, get growth and get mortality. We can get movement from the tags. So that's kind of what we're using as a, you know, to, to address that. You know, it's getting at the population as a whole. So it is including smaller fish and larger fish, but, you know, having the tags and those fish and, and hopefully having those, those fish that are available to us now grow and grow with our tags and, and, and you'll know, be able to gather information as that happens, you know, that's hopefully filling that gap. So to fill in that, that gap in data, we probably, we would need more of those fish in that 16 to 25 inch class. Is that what? I mean, we're, we're encountering those fish. We're tagging a lot of those fish. Um, I, I think, I mean, really at this point, it's kind of a time issue, just getting enough returns and enough data back in our hands to really start looking at that. Thank you. I'll go by there. Yeah. If anybody online has a question, you can use the reaction button there at the bottom of your screen and hit the raised hand and we'll we'll call on you. Uh, for your surveys. You, these numbers don't seem to add up. It seems like uh, where it says the recruitment was bad in 2012, does it account for we had the worst freeze in 2010 and 11 that probably wiped out that whole recruitment? I don't see how, it seems like weather factors as far as angler pressure, the uh, basically there's probably a half million new anglers in Georgia and everybody wants to go catch a redfish and keep it. And there's not, 
there's nothing in there to offset. There's South Carolina, Florida, Texas, everybody around us supplements stocked fish. And I know some of the South Carolina fish probably come to Georgia to get away from all the fish there. And I think the little data where you showed where the fish went to South Carolina and how you said uh, how Virginia and them had a great spawn when we had a shitty, excuse me, bad spawn. Uh, that year, don't you think those fish are more accustomed to freezing temperatures to where it doesn't affect them the same as where our fish are more warm natured? So it's gonna affect them more. We're gonna have more that's gonna die from the cold versus those guys, they know it's coming. They probably go to deep water to get away from it. So I don't think, I, don't, I can't see how comparing their fishery to our fishery can help hold any water. And well, not the other, my other one, sorry, the tagging deal. I see a lot of fish that get tagged. I tagged for years in the beginning, and I figured out really quick what these fish do. Five years most, they're going to stay in shore, and then they're going to start splitting. I've watched this fishery here. I moved to South Carolina for six years. This fishery was great before I left in 2010. I come back and it's a completely different fishery. Flats that I used to fish, there'd be three to 500 fish. You're lucky if you see 20. Where do those fish go? Why aren't they there anymore? Is it, is it from pesticide runoffs? Is there, what, what, what factors are we missing that are you guys missing? I mean, the water quality, what is it? I mean, our shrimp's not good. Our, there's bad black gill disease. Our crabbing's not good. Didn't all that, doesn't all that stuff add up to we have a problem to you guys? Well, I mean, I think there's a lot in there. I think right now we will try to, we could try to keep things to questions, direct to questions, but I, I'll answer. Um, I mean, yeah, there is a lot going on. There is a lot of variation. But one thing to keep in mind, you know, the fish in Delaware and Virginia might have been the same fish that, been, that were here, but for some seasonal difference, they moved up. It's, they don't have a constant population, but they saw fish. So it's possibly, you know, it, it, it's likely it might be the same regional population that is moving around. Um, but yeah, I mean, a lot of that stuff, you know, we don't know exactly what is going on regionally or environmentally on an annual basis that, you know, affects these numbers. I mean, and some of it's natural. There is a lot of natural variation in these long-lived fish. Um, you know, there's a paper in North Carolina recently, wind direction in the fall has a lot to do with um, the strength of year classes. I mean, people don't necessarily think about wind direction, but that could be a thing. It's blowing the larvae in the shore and in the marshes. Um, I mean, salinity definitely flows can play a factor, but it might not be salinity in the time of year we think it is. Yeah, you know, so I mean, there's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot in there, and there's a lot of environmental stuff that may kind of be aggregating to affect it. Um, so, I mean, yeah, good points. And I mean, I think we're here to kind of, you know, gauge, you know, what people think is going on and then possibly look at, you know, do we need to be more conservative about things? Yeah. Okay. All right, uh, Mr. Larry, uh, we're going to give you opportunity to unmute yourself and ask your question from Zoom. Uh, looks like you're unmuted, so go ahead. Um, yes, I was wondering if you could hear me. We can hear you, yes, sir. Uh, my question is, with all the um, talk on red drum, I see a lot of people keeping uh, black drum anymore. Is there any um, effort by the state of Georgia to look into if black drum or being um, overfish with restrictions on red drum. I see people keeping back drum all the time, and I was wondering if that species is going to be included in any um, data or research. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So we do encounter black drum in some of our net surveys. Um, there are regional stock estimates for black drum as well, and you know we contribute data to those. And um, you know, there's problem is there's not a lot of uh, there's just not a lot of sampling and a lot of effort going towards black drum uh, regionally. So there, you know, might be some questions there. I don't know if you have more. Uh, right now, ASMFC is completing a, a coastwide stock assessment. Um, depending on what the results of that, you know, 
comes back, uh, I mean, I guess there could be talk, but as of right now, there's no talk. I don't predict that overfishing is occurring or they're overfished right now. Um, right now, the early indication is that's not happening. And that is a highly migratory fish. So those sub-adults that we see, um, as they turn into adults, those fish migrate up and down the coast. So they'll be found in the Chesapeake uh, during the warm months where we see the large fish down here during the cooler months. I believe data from our, which, which one is Trammel or you know, the Trammel? Yeah, so data from our Trammel is actually some of the best data you know, in the region for the assessment. That's one thing we found out. So one of the questions I kind of had, we were talking about maybe highly migratory on these fish. And I'm just asking, so it says 63 red drum tagged in Wausau Sound. Is that the only place that you put those tags in those fish? For right now, yeah. And that's so kind we've of only done 63, right? So if at a 63, if only eight were taken outside of our study area, I wouldn't consider that highly migratory. I, I'm just, I mean, that's just my percentage, right? I mean, highly migratory, in my opinion, is like a Wahoo or Mahi. You know, this is regional at best. So I don't think that if only eight of those 63, and this is just me asking questions, like we need to be worrying about the North Carolina and the Virginia stops as much as what's going on here. I would be more concerned about what South Carolina and Florida are doing, at least in their zone, because they have the Northeast zone. Um, with that being said, and I know that these tags are expensive and, and y'all are doing the absolute best you can with what you're working with. Um, I think a lot of the question in regards to these surveys is guys are looking at this and we all know that this can be interpreted a lot of ways. Everybody sees it different. It's kind of like playing the game of telephone, but I think as a census, we all want to be like, okay, what do we need to do to help you and what do we need to do to make sure that we don't have a, and it's not a crash to say, uh, I had to explain this to a lot of guys who were talking about, hey, we, I catch 80 redfish all the time. And then we pull up a picture of their phone where they were just fishing yesterday and it's got one redfish. It's like, yeah, in the fall, you go hit that school and that one hole and you're like, oh yeah, there's so many redfish because you hit it for five days in a row and you load your freezer. There's no problem because that person wants to stop their freezer. You know, what's best for that one person, not best for us all. But what I'm getting at is we're, this is kind of very unique. There's a lot of people in this room that you probably never thought would say, hey, I'd like for you to lower the redfish limit. Um, so you've got us here and you've got the guides and people here. What can we do to help you with this data? And also the other thing that we're kind of talking about with all this data, and we do appreciate that is we can have a better stock. It's not about protecting what you're losing. It's about how good could this be? I mean, you know, the statistics on Georgia salt marsh, how much we have, we should have way better fishing than what we have right now. The fact that Glen County is basically a third of Santa Savannah, but we have almost the same amount of fishermen. That's a big alarm. And I know you mentioned that in one of them, that that's a pressure y'all are starting to recognize. Um, but that's something I just wanted to talk about with this survey is we want to be involved. We don't want to be on the outside when we go on the inside. So. That's kind of feel asked yeah. about the kind of Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. And, and one thing to keep in mind, and I didn't have a little detail in, but we are tagging kind of two different groups of fish in that study. And one is a lower end slot fish. And what's the breakdown? It's like 20, 40. Yeah. It's. So the other thing to keep in mind with that is, I don't think that, there's a, there's a lag. Oh, sorry. There's a lag between when those fish are tagged and when that data is received by us. So we had 60 odd fish tagged at that point in time, but when we got the last push of data, so some of the data would go out and download ourselves on our own receivers, but then the data that we received from other states comes in to us through other researchers and it takes quite a while to get that. So those last 20 fish, so I think at the time of that download, there were 43 that we were looking for. Those were the ones that um, so it, it can take as long as six months for us to get some of those data back. And those numbers were just running back in February and March. So, yeah, there may be plenty more of those. We just haven't received those data yet. Um, what we're seeing, too, I mean, they're about 24 inches. That's about a three to four year old fish. It's not necessarily a five year old fish. So, you know, as a smaller fish grow through, um, you know, we can see them go offshore and get a better estimate of how many, because 
right now it's small, but we're also kind of early on. So, you know, as we expand. Yeah. I'm looking here at the map and I assume the map they give out everybody, all these green dots and the red line, and that is where the escapement project was done? Yes. And that is called offshore. How about up the St. Mary's River, Satilla River, Alamaha, Brunswick River, Intercoast Waterway? What's, the, um, what's going on in those, those areas? Are those fish? Well, I can, you can say that, but I got a place up on um, the Satilla River and Wadoot Creek. I can catch them right now. And that's pretty, for, in, in January when you catch some of them, you can almost drink the water, it's so fresh. I mean, that's something we see with some of our sampling, you know, trying to get these fish tagged, you know, you know, trying to find them for conventional tagging or uh, for the acoustic tagging. We do see them in fresh. I mean, these guys probably have a little bit more towards that, but, you know, we do have coverage up the rivers. We're just not seeing them as much in the rivers, or we do have, you know, kind of a lot of hits of fish in the river. It's just not Obviously, it's not I know some of the bass tournament guys used to hang on some pretty good sized redfish while they were having bass tournaments in the Altamaha River. I don't know how long they're staying up in the river. I saw a, I saw a program on. I saw a program on TV this week, exactly what you're telling me. Hey, so for now, can we just um, keep it relative to do, uh, just questions and answers? Because we'll eventually at the end, we'll kind of have a time to have more comment and then we can have lots of the sheets. So I just want to keep this moving along. Hey, thanks again for, for you guys doing this. I was in Savannah as well on Tuesday. Just want to kind of reiterate one more thing. So you've got these fish that have acoustic tags in them, 64. My question for you so is, like, wow. out of the 400 what? and so I thought there'd be like six people there. She's a standing room all <laughs> Hi. Uh, I'm just gonna remind everybody at home, please uh, mute yourself, we'd appreciate that. And this might and this might be a little bit of a question for Chris as well, though. But so on these 64 fish that we've tagged up towards Savannah, um, I know a few of them have gone out of state and everything. But we had 440,000 pings off of those 60, call it 58 fish. How localized are those pings to where you guys are are putting these acoustic tags in them? I mean, are these fish? This is another thing about migration. Like, yeah, okay, I get lost every now and then too if I don't have you know my navigation on and I'm somewhere I don't know where I'm at and I may make a wrong turn, and some of these fish may do that. Um, but I think we've all learned from the tagging program that we've done with Donna. I mean, I've had fish caught, you know, a year later, 50 feet from where I released them. Um, to, to the gentleman's point about going up in a creek and catching them, I, I think that a lot of the survey stuff you're showing with that, that high catch rate in that lower slot to bring up what we talked about in Savannah are a lot of these fish maybe not making it from that 14, 15, 16 inch, up to that 19, 20, 22, 24. Um, so curious, just, I mean, is it very localized? Yeah, and, and Chris is seeing kind of the same thing you saw, you know, smaller fish which tend to, local, tend to be localized. So, you know, there are a lot of fish that get caught or get detected in one spot. And they'll go back and they're just sitting there for months on the end to the point where we're thinking, oh, since the fish dies, the tag just sitting on the bottom, but then it'll move. And we have, you know, we're located outside the state or outside, you know, some other weird sound where it's obvious it's a live fish. So they definitely are, you know, the smaller sizes, you know, very, you know, uh, territorial or very localized. And then, you know, at some point, and, that, and that's kind of what the, this project's getting at too, is at what point do they move from being those small localized fish to those, you know, bigger offshore fish? Yeah, at what age? Yeah. <laughs> I would All right, uh, we got one question online from uh, Mr. Brooks showing. Uh, I've asked you to unmute yourself and then uh, you have the floor, sir. 
Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. We can hear you. Well, thank you. Um, just wanted to comment on the first gentleman that was uh, making his comments concerning the number of red fish, and I just wanted him to know that um, how red fish is the sir, Mr. Schellen, uh, it sounds like you're a little muffled. Maybe um, you can maybe speak a little away from your phone, maybe. Okay. Is that any better? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, just wanted him to be aware, and I'm sure he is, that. Um, I tell you what, Mr. Schoen, would you mind sending a, a chat comment to us? It's, we're having some problems here in you. Would you mind typing your, your question to us in a chat message? Sure. Thank you, sir. I noticed on your first chart that you uh, did not make a correlation between change in regulations and the results of the surveys. Did you make any effort to uh, capture data on enforcement of in regulations with regard to changes in the population survey? I mean, we have, you know, over time, we do look at enforcement. Um, enforcement's not handled in our house, and we do get information about, you know, number of citations and everything over time. I don't think, I didn't have a look all the way back at that. We do have annual reports where that's listed. I know recently, you know, there are probably a few citations a year, um, but some of that's available in our. Um, so, two, oops, wow, I'm way louder than you are. Um, we've worked with law enforcement as part of um, our requirements for our compliance reports to the Atlantic States Commission. We have to report on enforcement. The ticketing database has changed over the years and in more recent years, and I would say within the last four or five years, we've actually been able to get better information to the species level about citations. So we don't necessarily have the longstanding history on species specific sites, but LE has been working really well with us to help get the information for us to understand that better um, as time has gone on. But yeah, unfortunately, we don't have a longstanding time history for those. I think we'll move on. So uh, I was a fishing guide for about a, a decade here, <clears throat> but even before I was a fishing guide, we'd go out trout fishing, not targeting redfish whatsoever, mainly trying to catch trout. Rod doubles down, drag gets pulled off the reel. You go, ah, it's one of those big reds. Fast forward 10 years, you go, that's a shark. It doesn't even cross your mind the possibility that that could be a redfish. To me, that's the canary in the coal mine. Not do I have a spot that I can go find redfish, because I'm sure a lot of us do and go crawl up a creek or we can find that one shell bed where there is a population of redfish. But how many incidental or accidental catches of redfish do we see now compared to 10 years ago? And the fact is just not as many. I'm not saying that I know everything. I'm just saying I did spend 200 days a year for 10 years on the water observing this. I also wonder what's the, the limit on redfish in North Florida? Is it two? What about South Carolina? What about Louisiana? Why do we think we're Louisiana? Because we're not. And then whether it's the fish moved up to Delaware or it's overfishing or it's environmental or it's cyclical, um, we can agree that something's happened, something's changed. We've worked on our trout, we've worked on our flounder, we've worked on various other species. Why are we fighting this one species so hard? when it seems like we can all agree that something shifted. Well, I mean, I think we're here tonight because we're not fighting, because we're giving information and, you know, we're opening the, the door to the conversation because we're seeing something, we hear your concerns through the, um, you know, I mean, just from hearing conversations, not the English Satisfaction Survey, which Kathy's about to talk about. So we recognize there's something going on. Um, you know, it, it's tough to compare us to other states because, you know, we've talked with folks in South Carolina, we've talked with folks in Florida. There is a difference between our states, even though, um, you know, we are, you know, side by side. Florida has a lot of habitat, and a lot more coastal growth issues. You know, we have some of the best protected marshes on the East Coast, you know, so we are different in some ways. Now, what that actually means, I don't know. And I think that's, you know, what we're trying to get a handle on and, and you know, between pressure and population. Um, you know, South Carolina has a lot heavier fishing pressure on some aspects. I mean, they have 
think their number was 300 guides fishing bull reds in Charleston Harbor. That's more guides than we have in the entire state here. So they have, South Carolina has a limited stocking program, but it's not fully, um, that gets kind of experimental. So, but, well, and that's a step. Well, that's a separate issue. I I wasn't here then, but I, I think I think we can move on to the satisfaction survey. We can bring this up after as for the, the whole conversation. Yeah. All right. Now I'm handing off to Kathy online. All right, Kathy, are you ready? Oh, uh, we had a uh, comment from Mr. Schoen. He sent it in, Jared. Uh, reduction in smaller uh, reduction in smaller fish is due to allowing 14, 15, 16 inch fish are being killed and the larger fish are not showing availability because they have been killed is what he's saying. All right, at this time, we're gonna turn it over to Kathy Knowlton. Uh, she's gonna be presenting here uh, via Zoom. Uh, Kathy, you've got the floor. Hello, can you guys hear me okay? Can you hear me? <clears throat> All right, can you guys hear me now? I can hear you. We can hear you, Kathy. Okay, excellent. All right, is the sound quality okay with my rate of speed for talking? We can hear you. Okay, excellent. All right, great. Thank you so much. I'm sorry, I'm very sorry that I couldn't be there with all of you tonight. I'm feeling a bit under the weather and I figured you didn't want me to bring my cough and uh, sore throat into a room packed with people, but I'm very excited to see um, that many people in the room and I hope we can continue this great conversation based on the results of the saltwater fishing satisfaction survey. Bear with me. There we go. All right. So the first thing to note is that as we go through the results of the most recent survey that was conducted, you're going to see a pattern where responses from anglers are in green and responses from guides are in blue. Originally, we had the first satisfaction survey conducted in 2017, and it was conducted by Responsive Management, which is a natural resources research company. They specialize in surveys for states relative to fishing and hunting questions with their constituents. We were able to again contract with them five years later for the recent survey that encompassed fishing during 2021. The majority of the questions were the same between the two surveys, and that is very important because it allows us to compare the answers between the two surveys. In terms of the questions that were asked and how anglers were selected, resident anglers were randomly selected from those holding SIP permits, the Saltwater Information Program permit. There's about 230,000 annually. When anglers were randomly selected and offered an invitation to participate, they could do so either by telephone and or online. Very important is that there was an initial screener question Everybody was asked first, did you participate in saltwater fishing in Georgia during 2021? If they did not participate in saltwater fishing during 2021, that was the end of the survey for them. They were no longer answering questions for the rest of the survey. Far more sample was selected than was needed to provide accurate results. At the end of the process, 2026, completed interviews make up this study. Those completed interviews represent saltwater anglers from 144 of our 159 Georgia counties. And they also, 45% of the interviews represent residents in the 11 coastal counties. That being the six coastal and the next tier in of five 
uh, near coast counties. Another one of the components that we'll talk a little bit about tonight is breaking the data into two different groups. Obviously, we analyze the data based on responses of all of the anglers that were surveyed. But we also broke down the analysis into two different groups, those responses from the coastal residents and non-coastal residents. We also separated and were able to look at the data based on what we call avidity. That's how often somebody fishes. Since we asked all the participating anglers to tell us approximately how many days they participated in red drum fishing in 2021, we were then able to partition the data into what we term an avid angler, one that fishes more than 10 days in a year, and a less avid angler, one that fishes 10 or fewer days in a year. The sampling for the guides was very different. Obviously with over 230,000 licensed saltwater anglers a year in Georgia, we are not able to sample every single angler. That's how the guides are different. It is a much smaller population with only 194 licensed resident saltwater guides. Every single one of them was invited to participate. They were contacted by both email from the company, emails from me and telephone calls and they were contacted repeatedly through both of those methods. At the end of the sampling period, 55% had chosen to complete the interviews. I'm gonna do a check here, Tyler, just to make sure that you all can hear me okay. Yep, we can hear you fine. Great, thank you. So one of the questions we obviously get a lot is, was 2026 completed interviews enough? How do you know what's enough? And like I told you on the previous slide, far more anglers were invited to participate to ensure that the minimum sample size was achieved. Quick little couple of points here from the world of statistics. The overall population that we needed to survey was those anglers holding a SIP permit. So we can calculate how many surveys, that is the sample size, that we needed to be 95% confident that the responses fall within a specified range of the actual value in the population. That may not sound uh, very clear at the beginning, but we'll go through a couple of examples. People very commonly say things like, I'm 90% certain of something, or I'm 95% certain of something. Well, a 95% confidence is a standard in statistics and in survey responses. So imagine that a hundred times random samples of anglers having SIP permits were selected. The results of 95 of those 100 rounds of surveys would fall in a range plus or minus 2%. So going through the rest of the presentation, if I tell you that a satisfaction level reported for a specific question was 64%, then we are 95% confident that the value for the entire population, that is all SIP permit holders resident in the state of Georgia, the value would be between 62% and 66%. That's the 64% plus or minus 2%. Probably breathe a sigh of relief. That's as far down into a statistics lesson as I'm gonna go tonight. So let's start delving in to some of the questions that were asked in the satisfaction survey. Again, there's a pattern, green for anglers, and blue for guides. The green stippled value are the 2017 responses and the solid bars are the 2021 responses. As you can see, and hopefully you can see my mouse here on the screen, there was an increase in fishing inshore, which is rivers and creeks for both the anglers and the guides comparing 2017 to 2021. An opposite pattern was seen for near shore, which are state waters, zero to three miles, and offshore, which is federal waters, three to 200 miles offshore. For both the anglers and the guides in both of those regions of water, there was a decrease in participation in fishing in that area. Please bear in mind that multiple responses were possible. An angler could have said they only fished in one area or an angler could have said they fished in two or three of the areas. Jared spent a pretty good amount of time 
talking about the MRIP data that is comprised of dockside surveys through Dawn and her crew to determine catch. And then there's also an effort survey that is completed to determine how many trips anglers are participating in in a given time period. You'll see here on the x-axis that the year span is 2009 to 2021. That is the same year coverage and time frame that Jared represented in almost all of his graphics. So we're going to stick to the same time period. A couple of things to note is that nearshore in yellow and offshore in gray are fairly, oops, excuse me, are fairly consistent and are a fraction of the inshore saltwater fishing. That's this green line here. And not only is it a fraction of the effort that's expended in, in those areas fished, but there is a significant trend in increase in inshore fishing in Georgia. A probability value of less than 0.05 and even more 0.01 is statistically significant. And our probability level is 0.00008. So we are seeing a statistically significant increase in fishing pressure as measured by effort in inshore Georgia waters since 2009. Also, I'd like to give you a little bit of background information on the harvest. We divide these data into three fishing modes, anglers fishing from private boat mode, anglers fishing from a charter vessel, and anglers fishing from a shore location. If you look at the last five years to incorporate and look at the average number of fish harvested in each fishing mode, <clears throat> you will see that 94% of the red drum harvest, that is number of fish, is harvested in the private boat mode by anglers fishing from their own private boats. Only 4% from shore and 2% from charter vessel. That makes sense when you realize that for average number of inshore trips, that's these green bars, these areas of inshore fishing trips, we estimate that anglers take on average 1.3 million trips, excuse me, compared to guides, which are almost 21,000 trips. So that's some background MRIP catch and effort data to give us a parameter for this discussion. Back to the satisfaction survey results. Again, anglers in green, guides in blue. We asked them if they typically fished for red drum. For those that indicated that they did not fish for red drum, that was the end of the survey for that section of species. We also asked about spotted sea trout, flounder, and sheep's head. For the purposes of this discussion tonight, however, we're gonna stick just to the red drum data. As you can see, anglers were fairly consistent in the percent of time that they fished for red drum. There was also a slight increase in their reporting to us the average number of days that they fished for red drum in the last 12 months during 2021. The story was a little bit different for the guides. You can see an almost 10% increase in their response for whether they typically fish for red drum. And they also had an almost two week increase on average in the number of days that they took clients fishing for red drum. There is a lot of data on this slide and I'm going to walk you through it. But there are some overall like 30,000 foot level points that I wanted to make sure that you were able to see all on one slide. And also at the end of this presentation, you'll get a one page summary that has these graphics on it as well to take with you. We asked anglers and guides, are you satisfied or dissatisfied with red drum fishing? We asked that question for four different categories, red drum fishing in general, the number of red drum caught, the average size of red drum caught, and their satisfaction or dissatisfaction with current regulations. So the anglers here in green, the yellow represents dissatisfied and the stripes represent <clears throat> no preference. So as you can see across all four of the satisfaction questions, there is decreased satisfaction among anglers for all four criteria. If you take the difference between this value, this value, this value, and this value and average it, that's where you get that decrease of 10% of the anglers that are less satisfied with red drum fishing 
in 2021 compared to 2017. If you do the same comparison over here on the right for the same responses to questions on the guides, the decrease in satisfaction is even more pronounced. Again, fishing in general for red drum, number of red drum caught, average size of red drum caught, and current regulations. Something interesting and not unexpected is that the number of captains that had no preference for their satisfaction level was much smaller than when that question was asked of anglers. Again, if you take the average of each of these categories, you see that the, across the board, there was on average a 21% decrease in satisfaction level among guides fishing for red drum. So we're gonna delve a little bit more next into the regulations, questions about the regulations. For those people that said that they, anglers and guides, were not satisfied with current regulations, we asked an open-ended question about what would make them more satisfied. We literally asked them to give us a few words as a response that would make them more satisfied with current regulations. It's hard to summarize open-ended questions, but again, the 30,000 foot view of this response is that the top two responses for both anglers and guides would be a decrease in bag limit and an increase in size. So again, these were anglers and guides that were not satisfied with current regulations. Remember on the first or second slide, I told you about our ability to partition the data into two different pieces, coastal and non-coastal, and avid and less avid. We did this because we often hear from anglers and guides that they think that people that reside on the coast may fish differently than people who are coming from non-coastal counties in Georgia. We also hear that people feel that anglers and guides that are more avid, spend more of their time and more days a year fishing, may respond differently or fish differently than those, than those who fish less frequently. So what you see is looking first at this coastal partition in the data, there are no percentages listed under red drum fishing in general, number of red drum, and size of red drum. That's because there was not a statistically significant difference in their responses. Their responses were less than that 4% total range that I told you about, which means that from a statistical point of view, there is no difference in the satisfaction levels for coastal and non-coastal anglers in those three categories. The only category in which there was a statistically significant difference was their satisfaction with red drum regulations. More coastal anglers are dissatisfied at 25% than non-coastal anglers in the regulations. Looking at a similar pattern for the avidity, you can see that three of the categories have a statistically significant difference in the responses and therefore dissatisfaction between avid anglers and less avid anglers. More of the avid anglers are dissatisfied with red drum fishing in general, size, and current regulations. We also asked anglers and guides, what would you like the slot size and bag limit size to be? There were a lot of responses. And again, it's somewhat difficult to summarize this at the 30,000 foot view, but I'm gonna take a stab at it. In 2017, only 15% of the anglers said that they would support a bag limit reduction to less than five fish. By 2021, that percent of responses had doubled and 30% of the anglers support a bag limit of fewer than five fish. Again, interestingly for the guides, they were very consistent in their responses, 68% on the nose, both years the surveys were conducted. We also asked if the anglers and guides would support a slot size limit change. Anglers and guides supported an increase of maximum size limit, but the answer was not as clear for anglers. Excuse me, the answer was not as clear relative to supporting an increase of minimum size. So the guides had a more clear response that they supported an increase in the minimum size limit. <clears throat> Excuse me. A new question for 2017 was whether the anglers and guides would support or oppose a vessel limit. 
You can see in that graphic that 20%, which is in yellow, only 20% of the anglers indicated they would oppose a vessel limit. And a smaller number at 13% of the guides indicated that they would oppose a vessel limit. What would potentially a vessel limit look like, however, relative to the trips that we know that people are taking right now? We call this a vessel limit analysis, where we look at the total number of fish across all of the trips that are harvested and estimate how large a reduction you would see with various combinations of a vessel limit. So you can see here to the right that obviously something is going on and you would have a larger reduction in expected harvest at 10 or five fish. So we then looked into the data a little bit more in a more detailed fashion and instead of having just increments of five, now we had from five to 10 fish. What this tells you is that we would expect based on fishing and harvest on trips over the time period of 2009 to 2021, that if a 10 fish vessel limit was imposed, that it would reduce harvest by 2%. On the other end, if a five fish vessel limit was imposed, we predict it would be a reduction of harvest of 15%. So here we are at our first action. There are going to be five actions that I am presenting to you with various options included. As soon as my presentation is done, the staff will pass out the comment sheet and all of these questions will be listed on the comment sheet for you to select an option and provide us with written comments. The comment sheet is also available Jared had the web address at the end of his presentation, and I've got it at the end of my presentation, and it is also listed at the bottom of the comment sheet you will get. So if you would rather think about it or submit your answers uh, electronically, you'll be able to do so at the website that we're gonna give you. So what would a reduction in the angler bag limit look like if one was pursued? Again, you see a negative number because it's the reduction estimated in harvest. So for 2009 to 2021, those trips indicate to us based on the harvest obtained during the, that time that a reduction to a four fish angler bag would reduce harvest by an estimated 5%. And then you can see the values for three, two and one fish with an angler bag limit of one fish expected to reduce red drum harvest by 43%. This graphic here on the bottom, the bars to the right are the same values as what you see in the table on top. What's different is we're often asked for the seasonal impact of harvest because we all know there are more trips in the fall for um, seeking to harvest red drum and more red drum are in fact harvested during the fall. So you can see that since the majority of the harvest is in two fish and one fish, that the seasonal impact is going to be larger for those potential reductions in angler bag limit. And we come to action number two that we're gonna ask you for your feedback on. Should the bag limit be decreased? One question that was not asked in the satisfaction survey but it has come up as a topic of conversation, is whether people would support or oppose no bag limit for charter captains and crew. The question came up during FinFish AP meetings with CRD staff. The comments have been made during previous meetings from additional charter captains that are not on the FinFish AP. And also we see that Florida has proposed in May of this year, a statewide change such that captain and crew are prohibited from retaining the bag limit. So action three on the comment sheet is going to be asking for your feedback of whether captains and mates should retain a bag limit, should continue to retain a bag limit. During the survey, we gave anglers and guides six slot size limits and asked them out of those choices, what would they like the slot size limit to be? There was one change from 2017 to 2021, and that was the addition of a category for other. That's why you see not applicable among the 2017 responses, but you see that, for instance, 
the guide's number one ranked selection was to select a slot size limit other than the six initially presented. For the anglers, their responses were fairly consistent from 2017 to 2021. Back in 2017, the highest ranked choice was 14 to 25 inches. The second highest ranked choice was the current regulations of 14 to 23. In 2021, you'll see that two choices were ranked evenly, they tied. Therefore, there's not a rank of two, and that is indicated by the asterisk. The guide's responses varied between the years, and you can see that initially their number one response was 15 to 23, but in 2021, they gave options for other slot size limits than the six presented. The second highest ranked was 15 to 25 inches. The third highest ranked response was the current regulations. <clears throat> Action four will be, should the slot size limit be changed? Option A would be status quo. Option B would be yes. And we'll ask you to please give us a comment on what you think that slot size limit should be. This table to the right is given to you as an example of what various slot size limits and bag limit combinations do in terms of achieving our management goals. The last time a stock assessment was done, which required a change in regulations by the South Atlantic States for red drum was in 2002. The two more recent stock assessments did not require a change in regulations by the states for the regional management and remember that we're underway with another stock assessment right now. So these data are very dated, being from 2002, and we expect that these percentages would have changed by now. The only reason I'm including them is to give you that example on what changes as you have various combinations. Our management goal is to have a 40% or greater spawning potential ratio. That's the SPR. When this analysis was done, those bag and slot size limit combinations that did not achieve the 40% SPR were not available to the states to consider. So you can see how with all of these combinations above 40%, you can see how at the time in 2002, 14 to 23 with a bag of five was an acceptable combination. You'll also see that as you increase the upper size limit, in this example, it was only by one inch, that has pretty significant implications on the acceptable bag that you can use going forward. Only one or two fish had the selection been made for the higher slot size limit, slot size limit sorry. Also wanted to point out to you that when you increase the lower size from 14 to 15, it makes very little difference in the percentage of the SPR, which again is our management goal for the region. You can see that at 15 to 23, it was acceptable and achieved 40% SPR for five fish. But same story is over here. If you raised the upper slot limit by an inch, only one or two fish in the bag would have been acceptable at that time. For the stock assessment that is currently ongoing that Jared mentioned, we have asked for a terms of reference to be completed and have this table updated so that we have information moving forward that is much more updated and relevant to now. And we'll be getting that information in the future when that stock assessment is completed. And finally, the last is, would you support or oppose a season for Red Drum? We got a resounding opposition to this question from both anglers and guides with about 55% of anglers and about 60% of guides across both year spans. But we also wanted to ask you your opinions since you are attending these town hall meetings. So the last question is, should there be a red drum season? And again, option B, if you think there should, please tell us what season you think should be considered. You can see here for reference, the regulations in the other South Atlantic states, and in particular, this 2022 change for captain, no captain and crew bag limit, and also to reduce the vessel limit to four, down from eight to four. And that's for the Northeast Florida region. So here we are with the next steps. We presented the results of 
Jared's Red Drum summary of the research that we currently have to the FinFish Advisory Panel on June 1st, as well as the results of the satisfaction survey. We're here at our town hall. Here's the web address where you can submit your comments electronically. If we make the decision to make a possible regulatory recommendation to the board, that would happen in August. And by the board, I mean the Georgia DNR board. The Georgia DNR board has authority for red drum regulations. We would then go back out to official public hearing and comments in September. And were we to make a final recommendation to the DNR board for a possible rule action that would occur in October with the January 2023 implementation. I hope you guys are all still there and I will be delighted to They're coming around, Kathy. I'll move over okay. here so it doesn't go all crazy. On. And since I'm coming in through Zoom, I would just request you all please use the mic so I can hear your fantastic questions. All right, Kathy, I'm going to use the microphone first. Thank you. Thank you for being here, even when you're under the weather. We appreciate that. I really did not want to miss it, but thank you for saying that. So my question, it's complicated, so bear with me here. The okay. most up-to-date information I could find through the SIP program was in 2018, and the report was prepared in 2018. Yeah. And it said that the estimated number of anglers was 109,742. Mm -hmm. And according to the presentation that we just had from 2017 to 2021, it was estimated at 1,374,000. Yeah. Is that correct? You've got a great eye. So, right, so there was... You want me to explain why they're so different real quick? No, I, I, we can, but if you just let me yep. go, I'll sure. try to get to my question quickly and then we'll go from there if that's all right. Sure. All right, so that's, uh, if we just use the coastal anglers, that's just the anglers that live on the coast, that's a 1,152% increase. Total anglers, that's a 422% increase. And if you combine the coastal and non-coastal anglers, that's 590% increase. That's not even accounting for the out-of-state anglers. My question is if our change or potential briefing is in August and our rule action is in October and then the implement implementation is in January and the most up-to-date SIP report we had is from 2017, are we going to have more up-to-date information? Like I said, like I asked in Savannah, it seems two-pronged, the Angler Satisfaction Survey and then the scientific data is what's going to be moving this decision or at least moving the briefing. That doesn't take into account that incredibly high increase in angling pressure that's occurred from 2017 to 2021. So my question is, Will that huge increase in pressure also be included in this very short time span we have between the briefing, the comment period, and the potential implementation? Okay, that's a great question. Thank you for that. Uh, you've got a very good eye, and I appreciate that you went onto our website and looked at the SIP reports. Those have not been updated in the last few years because there was a change in methodology used to calculate effort estimates. In the past, prior to the late 2010s, around 2017, 2018, I'm hoping you guys can hear me. It sounds a little bit rough, but I'm hoping you can hear me. Okay. We're gonna hear okay. um, the method that was used to estimate effort from saltwater anglers, and this is the method that is used up and down the whole Atlantic coast, not just Georgia, was a telephone survey, coastal household telephone survey. But as you can guess, there are very few people that have landlines in their coastal households. And just because you have a cell phone number that relates to a certain area, it doesn't mean you live there. So there was a very long, about three year overlap period where they tested a new effort methodology and it was peer reviewed twice. And basically they went from measuring in apples this way to changing it to oranges. And so they had to go back and apply the new method to the previous estimate. 
So what you'll see is in that static document that was produced in 2018 for the 2017 fishing year, those are the old numbers. We don't use those numbers anymore. So what I want you to do is see here, these are the official estimates for number of trips taken by Georgia anglers in inshore waters. And that's where you see that significant increase. So it's not the level of increase that you're talking about when you calculated the percentage changes from the 2018 report to now, but there is a statistically significant increase in fishing pressure in Georgia in inshore waters. Hopefully that helps answer your question. It's a great question. Just a reminder to anybody online, if you have a question, um, you can use the reaction thing at the bottom to um, raise your hand and we will call on you. Hey, Kathy, how you doing? Hey. So I'm going to bring up two things and, and I think it's kind of one of them is going to be the elephant in the room for this survey and I just really want your feeling on it. But first, I was going to tell you. So today I ran into two guys from Macon that are at St. Simon's or Morningstar Marina. They fish about, I don't know, once a month. They inshore fish every time. I ran into them and I always ask them, how'd you do? And the guy goes, man, it was amazing. I caught two redfish today. And I was like, really? And he goes, yeah. And I said, well, how many did you catch last time? I oh, didn't catch any last time. I was like, okay. And I was like, hey, are y'all coming to the meeting tonight? And they were like, what meeting, blah, blah, blah. And uh, they didn't know about it. And I said, well, did you do the survey? Yeah, we did. I was like, okay. So I was kind of asking them questions and stuff. So as guys from Macon and versus maybe some guys from the coast, I'm thinking like, okay, these guys are stoked that they caught two redfish and they filled out this survey, right? And then I'm looking at, and I could be wrong, if we have 230,000 SIP permits, right, versus the state, and we sample 2,000, that's less than 1%. I mean, that's better odds. I mean, I wouldn't base anything of my life decisions on 1% because I've seen enough variables in everything I do that 1% is not enough. And I I think that's the elephant room is that scares a lot of us that we would do public opinion just on 1%. I think a lot of that data is trending in the right way. So we are looking at, but I also am a little worried that maybe some people in the organization will tell me that, well, it's not enough to make a change, right? That's the really scary thing. I talked to one person, DNR, I'm not gonna you know, call him out, but he told me I'd have public opinion and science. So I've seen both of those tonight on the screen, right? But how much do I gotta have to sway this person to make this change happen? That's my biggest fear. And I think that's one that we're all really like, okay, we're doing all this, but does it gotta be 50%? Does it gotta be 20%? Where does it have to be? And we all know that I don't need a guy from Helen that trout fishes telling me how many redfish I need to keep because he came down to the coast and fished off the pier one time. And, and that's when we only sample 2000 people, we don't know how many people are in that zone, you know what I mean? So that's my point I'd hope you address. I would be delighted to address that point. And that's why I went back, hopefully you all can see it, the slide to um, the basics of the statistics of this. Statistics is not understanding statistics. And when I throw out terms like statistically significant, that's not necessarily very comfortable for most people. It's hard to wrap your head around it. People are inherently very comfortable with a survey. And that's, that's how we did the portion with the guides because there were only 190 some of them and it was feasible to do so. It's not feasible to try to survey all 230 resident SIP permit holders um, annually from the year. So we have to subsample. We absolutely have to subsample. And statistical analysis and how you calculate the confidence interval, which is basically that same phrase as me saying, I'm 95% confident. This is a science and this is a something that the company that the <clears throat> responsive management contractor who did the survey, they've been doing these for 33 years. They're the best in the country. And that's who we had do the surveys both in 2017 and 2021. So it's not that we only talk to 1% of the residents SIP permit holders, and what if their 1%, what if that 1% is way with the difference than what other people think? The point is that because of the science behind statistics, 
we can calculate based on the size of the population, which is 230,000, there's a formula that tells us we can be 95% confident that the responses fall within a percentage of the actual value with only 2,000 interviews. Far more people were invited to participate and when extras could be obtained, they were included. And so go back to that middle component. And I realize this is extremely uncomfortable for people to accept survey methodology. And it, it, it just follows people's minds that 2,000 interviews could possibly be enough. But we know from statistics and survey science that it is. So if we pulled a random sub subsample 100 times over and over and over from those 230 SIP permit holders, and each time you selected them the same way, and you conducted that two-week, three-week survey a hundred times, the results of 95 of those surveys, each answer, each response, would fall between plus or minus 2%. So the way to think about it is the survey value, an example of the survey value of, do you oppose a vessel limit? And so let's, or do you support a vessel limit? Let's say that was the one. And the response from the subsample was 64%. We know from survey science and statistics that we're 95% confident that the value for all the SIP permit holders, the entire population, is actually the real value is between 62 and 66. That plus or minus 2% and 64. So the accuracy of these data and the amount of variation on either side of the estimate is extremely small. And these data are extremely accurate. I'm hoping that helps. Kathy, you've got a question from online. Uh, Mr. Larry, I'm gonna go ahead and let you unmute yourself. Uh, you'll have to unmute yourself and then you have the floor, sir. Okay, thank you. My question is with talking about the um, boat uh, vessel limits, is that just for being discussed for red drum or is that just going to be something that's applied to all species that um, have a limit or is that just a, a red drum specific um, discussion that we should uh, comment on? I Thanks. really appreciate that you're asking that question because that's a very important, extremely important clarification that I could have done better on. This would only apply to red drum. That's it. I just a reminder to everybody online, <laughs> if you've got any questions, you can use the reactions feature to raise your hand and we'll call on you. Uh, and as a reminder too, if everybody could stay on mute uh, until they're called on, we'd appreciate that. Thank you. I'm Ronnie Gaskins from Georgia Hunting and Fishing Federation. Sitting here and listening tonight, a few things uh, stuck out to me was if I'm saw in the first presentation, you know, out of the, the tag fishing, only 44% of them were taken by, were harvested. Then, then we moved to this survey and we see where our, our number of fishermen is, is tremendously higher than, than it was 10 years ago. And we're, we're certainly selling a lot more fishing licenses now than we did 10 years ago, which brings in a lot more funds for the, for the biologist and the DNR to work with. Um, my, my opinion is there, there's still enough fish out there to make people want to buy a license, buy a boat, spend money, a five and $6 gas, come fishing. And whether they catch two fish or, or 10 fish, it's not making that much difference in the amount of fish that's out there compared to the number of anglers that's out there. And I see no reason to be mucking with it because uh, you go to changing something, you, you, you can cause a lot, lot more further problems. If we, we run all these fishermen off, it's gonna be hard to get them back. Hmm. Well, I appreciate you talking. Uh, I appreciate you talking about um, the component of releasing legal fish. Jared had that percentage in his presentation, and this was something that I had at the end in case the question came up. And so we did ask 
anglers if they release legal red drum? And if so, what percent of the time? So you can see that guides and anglers release all or nearly all of their legal size red drum about 25% of the time. And you can also see that more anglers are unlikely to release any legal size red drum than those anglers that are fishing on charter boats with the guide. And we also look at when anglers said they released the red drum, we asked them why, which is an important question and has to do with some of the discussion tonight. For those that released legal red drum, the largest percentage of them said they did it because they practiced catch and release. But they also indicated that they already have enough fish. So maybe they've already reached the bag limit and want to fish for something else, or they just simply don't want to take home five fish, even though they're legally allowed to do it. They also, 21% of them indicated that they don't want the fish on the smaller end of the slot. They want a few larger fish at the upper end of the slot. So I appreciate your comments that you don't think that we should change things. And that is one of the reasons that we've given these presentations and that you will receive, if you haven't already, sorry, I can't see in the room, the paper comment sheet that you can either fill out tonight or you can do it electronically. And the deadline for doing those electronically is two weeks from tomorrow. And so one of the interesting things about a sampling survey, like the satisfaction survey, is that we feel very confident that the results of that survey represent the population of resident Georgia saltwater anglers. When we have things like these town halls, and later if we pursue a recommended change, official public hearings with comments, that is a combination of where people are choosing volunteering to come in and give their comments. So in this way, we're able to collect the data both in a specifically sound manner, as well as people are interested in the topic and want to learn more and want to supply their comments in meetings like tonight. I hope that helps a little bit with your concerns. <laughs> yes, my name is Captain Wendell Harper. And uh, I've been on the, I've been on the committee for quite a while ever since I started. And I'm a charter captain here in Georgia. And uh, I've been doing it since the seventies all the way through. And I've seen a drastic decrease in our fishery in redfish and trout. I mean, we don't, we're talking about redfish, but, uh, and the all of my hall, they can tell you, they can show you a thing that says it's got an increase this year. It was, but the increase is lower than the lowest part of the whole 10 years. So that tells you we got a problem. When I can't go out there and catch, uh, I'm not letting my people keep the three fish right now. I've been doing it for the last two years, just three fish. And I can't catch six fish for two people. We got a problem. Cause I'm used to catching five fish per person for four fish, four people, 20, 25 fish on the boat. You can't see it no more. I can, I can do it. But if I want to do it, I'm going to go into one spot and hit that spot for about three days and then it's over with. It's over with. So that's the reason why we're trying to keep our fishery at a sustainable fishery, at a good fishery for my grandchildren, your grandchildren, and everyone else. We want, we want our fishery to build up and be able to have a sustained fishery for all of our fish. And that's, that's just what we're trying to do, just help our fishery out where everybody can come in and catch a mess of fish. Thank well, you. Well, Wendell, thank you for that. One area in which um, this kind of shows what you're talking about is that we've had a five fish bag since 2002. And I realized that there, with the annual recruitment changing or with um, skilled angler or maybe like somebody else said habitat issue changes, it's highly variable for this fish because they're so long lived and they recruit into the fishery when they're only one and two years old. They haven't reached um, reproductive levels yet. They're immature. And so I often have people, we hear people say, well, it's five fish. I want to be able to keep five fish. And then we went back and looked at the data 
And without a bag, change, very few people are tapping typically three and four fish. Going down to three fish bag would be expected to reduce harvest by 11%. But what that would do is have more of a limit on when people encounter those pools of the fish barely bigger than young of the year and starting to get into the slot, the number of fish that could be harvested at that point, if that makes any sense. Hey, Kathy, I got a question for you. Hey. Uh, more like a, a homework assignment. So, <coughs> excellent. <laughs> Salt Strong, if you're familiar with that, they're just posted this thing. They have 30,000 redfish they bought privately from Moat Laboratory. So I'm always about like, let's, what's the solution here? I know in this room, we could have a fundraiser and raise $40,000. I'm sure Savannah could probably double that. What does it cost us per fish if we buy fish from an individual company to do stocking? I'd like to find that out. Does that be something that we could do if we could get the permit to release them? and through accredited lab, let's find a dollar amount and let's see what we can do there. Because that's something we need to do regardless of changing any of these limits. Um, and then second, like, do we have any data on what it would cost for us to start doing our own hatchery? And that's, that's pretty much it. Okay, so back more than 10 years ago, we had a pilot project called the Peak State Red. And it was designed to be a um, valid approach to looking into that very same question that you're asking. And we collaborated with um, South Carolina DNR to use their hatchery. We took our brood fish up there um, and they were released in a couple of areas. And then we looked at the contribution that those stock fish made to the harvest and it was extremely small and when you look at the amount of money that was needed to build our own hatchery let alone keep it up with personnel and the cost per fish in terms of how many fish that would increase to the fishery was very cost prohibitive um, one of the we all know that money is a limiting factor as much as we don't like it, as uh, much as we really don't like it. Um, so one of the things that we can do right now, very hard to make changes in water quality or the amount of people moving here or from the bottom up build a huge stocking program. What we have been able to do with money that we've recently received, the price of licenses was increased for both recreational and commercial licenses a few years ago. And that money goes into a very specific account that we have to follow and present information, summary information on what those projects are used for. And one of the ways in which those uh, extra funds were used was to add a third sound system to the netting projects. And that's where I think on year three or four, Jared, Ryan, Chris, maybe could talk more to that. But the amount of money that would need to be spent for the contribution of stocked fish to the population is very cost prohibitive. Okay, we can't, we can't hear whatever's being said in the room. Hold on a second, Kathy. Kathy, the question was, how do other states afford to uh, stock stock? Is that about right? Yeah. Okay. So he's saying we're the only state that's not doing that. So he should, the question is, how do other states do it? I know that I know that South Carolina has 
a really strong history starting in the 80s for about 30 years where um, a senator, a, a federal level senator, um, was able to push a lot of funds in the development of the research arm of South Carolina DNR that included the stocking component. And in Florida, I remember going down there when we were talking about the Peach State Reds initiative those year, a uh, few years ago, actually more than 10 years ago, and talking to the folks that created the hatchery for the St. Pete area and, and the sound and them saying that unless you have basically more money than you know what to do with, you have to have that kind of funding to even consider for an area. And there's federal dollars called sport fish restoration. It is very similar to the money that it's an excise tax that's on it's a combination of a tax on fuel for vessels and fishing poles and tackles and engines and the companies that sell those items are required by law to give a certain amount of money towards this fund sport fish restoration fund and that is then divvied up among the coastal states based on a combination of their number of certified license holders as well as area, how big it is. And there's caps so that tiny places don't get stuck with just a tiny bit of money and huge places don't swallow up all the money. And we currently use those sport fish restoration dollars to fund the programs that we're already doing. And we would not be able to fund a hatchery based on sport fish restoration dollars. Kathy. Kathy, I'm sorry to jump in here real quick, but uh, the library just told us that we uh, they're closing at eight o'clock and we need to be out of here by eight o'clock. So we probably have time for one or two short questions. Hey, Kathy, how are you? Um, just two things to add to that. I know CCA does a, a big part in a lot of those stocking programs as well. So some of it's privately funded, I know. Uh, the question I have, and it's an opinion for all the DNR with all the data you guys have for some, I've been, a, I, I've been, a, I've been in fishing guide here for, you know, 25 years, Wendell's doubled me or more on that. But, but my question for, for all the, the people in here that have done all this research and everything is, don't you guys think, I mean, we had an amazing red fishery here years ago. Don't you guys think just with some proper management? and some changes that, that we could possibly, because of the pressure, I mean, obviously there's a lot more people fishing now, but don't you guys think we could see a fishery like we had in the past? I mean, we've had our up and down years. I think we can all agree it's, 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 it's pretty down right now. So the short answer is that's a pretty loaded question because there's so much that affects these fish. Um, there's more that we are, we're focusing on, as you've all indicated, we've got environmental changes. We're not really sure how that's affecting it, um, how that affects your recruitment, how that all feeds upline into what's going on with the population overall. Um, it's as far as the discussions on the management that again, that's why we're all here tonight. If you were asking us as science people to focus on what we normally focus on, which is a stock assessment. Based on our opinions, there isn't a problem with the stock biologically. So let me just say this, but what we are hearing is that the fishermen and the people who are on the water are telling us there are issues. That's why we're in the room, we're discussing and we're talking to you all to find out what are things that we can do and what the impacts are to help with those issues that are going on in the fishery as, as you're seeing it. Um, so again, we're, we're not saying based, based on science alone, the door isn't shut. Um, we, we have options. We've given you five that we're willing to talk about and see where we can go to from here. Our biggest problem and the words you don't want to hear is uncertainty. We can't forecast it, but we'll do our best to help to maintain the sustainability of the stock. Carolyn, what is the best escapement plan for these fish as far as size limit? I mean, 
I know at 14 to 23 in Georgia at five fish, how many supposedly matures enough to make it to the ocean? So that's the problem is we don't really have an understanding of the number for escapement. The SPR is actually a proxy for escapement. So we need, based on the life history of the fish, 40% is the ratio that we aim for. Um, what we're, one thing that we can say, which it's for discussion with the public comment as well, slot limits right now, because of the age of the data, and what we're showing you there was back when we were making those decisions in 2002, we had to look for 40%. Stock assessments, those numbers can change. Because um, if you look at the size range for Florida, when we looked at this table for the size range that currently exists, it wasn't making 40%. So as the population changes over time, things rebound, those numbers can change. Um, so we really need to have an updated slot limit analysis done, which is again, back to what Kathy indicated when the management board talks about what they wanna see come out of the stock assessment, we will be requesting that Doug and Spud, who is on that management board, asked specifically that that slot limit get done. We just don't feel comfortable doing it right now because that, that data is aged. Gotcha. So I, I think that was, it's an oversimplification. I have, we have to, I can, no, 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 I, and I'm saying, that's what I mean is um, I'm not 100% sure context on that, but there are costs to changing limits. Um, again, Florida has one benefit to ours is the fact that their data is strong enough to support a state specific stock assessment. We don't have the ability to do one of those complex models. So that's why we're trying to work with the data that we have at hand. And again, trying to use information from y'all to help guide us forward. Um, and like I said, when we get to the next stage, we can definitely talk about options. These actions that we've proposed are five that we're willing to look at. We can do none, we can do all, we can do some, but we want input from you all to help us guide what are those things that you would like to see done. A uh, quick question. Um, this is to, I guess, any of the DNR in the room. Do y'all hold the opinion of me as an angler the same as all these captains and guides in the room for surveys and um, questions on bag limits and whatnot? Because honestly, I've been fishing all my life. I've been fishing down here a good bit. Um, I mean, I don't know what the right answer is. I fish 15 days a year, okay? These guys are out here every day and I've never, so I mean, I'm a shop owner as well as some other guys in the room and I've never seen guides react like this before. So I would just hope that you are taking their opinion over, you know, is weighted a good bit more than a recreational angler like myself. So that's all I want to say. Thank you. So the short answer to that is everybody has equal opinion. And the reason I will tell you that is because you're also dealing with state legislators who are also listening to their constituents. So everybody has to have equal voice at the table. All right, we got one more online question, Mr. Larry. I'm gonna give you a chance to unmute yourself and um, you, you can ask your question, sir. Um, yes, I just had two quick questions. Um, are you entertaining any circle hook possible regulations um, in using live bait? And does the legislature have to be involved in any changing of the uh, limits on, on red drum? I know there's some restrictions imposed by state law and I was wondering if they have to be involved in this in any way also. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I can take this one if you want. Sure, go ahead, Kath. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> there's been a lot of conversation both at the state level and at the federal level through the council about requirements for um, circle hooks with live bait. Um, that there's an aspect of that that's, that's I think in the snapper grouper management plan, but our conversations with law enforcement in terms of inshore fishing um, is that it's much like what we went down the path of a recent educational campaign for tarpon and encouraging people to use best release practices um, and educate them rather than being a regulation because regulating um, a, a 
equipment use like that is going to be very difficult. It's going to be challenging. I know, Ellie, thank you uh, for your time here tonight too. Law enforcement, appreciate that. Um, it, it's a challenge in terms of what are you, what are you targeting? And, and if you're out there bull red fishing, you know, it becomes not as easy a combination as you would think in terms of, oh, we'll just, we'll just regulate that. But one component that I did not put in the presentation that I, I was very, very pleased to hear was the use of circle hooks and short leader circle hooks already being um, utilized by anglers and guides. So in the 2021 survey, um, we asked anglers if they targeted bull reds and about 35% of them said yes. And for those that said yes, 87% said they're already using circle hooks and 54% of those are using short leader circle hooks. And for the guides, it was a much higher percent of the guides that said they were targeting bull reds at 76%. And of those that are targeting bull reds, 93% are already using circle hooks with 72% short leader circle hooks. So I think personally, I really like the option of making it about education and best release practices and um, going down that pathway. And then your question about would the legislators be involved? Right now, authority to handle regulations for saltwater fishing, freshwater fishing, and hunting is held in a combination between mostly the DNR board and some authority uh, by the commissioner. You know, the commissioner is responsible for opening and closing food shrimp season, as an example. So right now we have the authority to make recommendations for change, but we didn't use to always. And so um, there was a time where saltwater regulations, portions and bits and pieces of them were controlled directly by the legislators. And one thing that there's many benefits to that authority through the board. They meet 10 times a year. It is, uh, we are required to have a public process that's very detailed and laid out. It's, it's a Georgia law, the Administrative Procedurals Act. Public are invited to every DNR board meeting and the DNR board are specialists. They deal only with natural resource questions. And when legislators are dealing with everything from taxes to infrastructure to Medicare, and um, it's kind of sometimes it's a challenging conversation about, about fishing but the legislators could change the Georgia law and, um, and alter what authority falls under the board versus the legislators. And so That's we want to keep a very good open communication with our legislators and present to them the results of these meetings as well as the satisfaction survey, because it's important. It's what their constituents are saying. Thank Kathy, you. I think that may have to be our final thought for the evening, unless you've got anything you'd like to add. Well, um, Carolyn, you got anything you want to add? No, again, I just want to thank you all for coming. Again, I, your opinions are valuable to the agency, and we do want to work forward to find a solution that will find the balance between, as indicated, anglers, charter folks. Um, we will take your comments. Again, those of you, there's enough space on your paper. If you have additional comments, again, if you feel strongly about stocking, there's not much we can do within CRD about that that's generally going to be at a higher level, which is going to have to come through legislation and discussions elsewhere, but at least get the comments to us and we will make sure that the comments are distilled through the board and from there, however, it goes out of the commissioner's office. We'll, we'll again, just make sure that the information gets to where it needs to go. But again, thank you for your time tonight. Um, keep an eye open through our webpage to see what the progress is going forward and we'll definitely keep people apprised as it goes on. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you all for joining us online. Uh, you can find more information at coastalgadnr.org slash reddrumtownhall. That concludes tonight's meeting.